Hi everyone, I am Varsha Sharma. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Teen Vogue and I'm thrilled to be bringing this conversation to you today in partnership with the Sustainable Fashion Forum. We've got a really great keynote lined up with Justin Portery, who is Head of Sustainability at Depop, joining us today virtually from London. Justine, thank you so much for being here. So I just wanna give our viewers a little bit of background um, about yourself first. You joined Depop in 2019 as the first sustainability hire, which I definitely wanna ask you about that. You have since led efforts to embed and champion sustainability at the company, both internally and externally. Prior to joining Depop, you had held sustainability focused roles at PwC, Unilever and EY, and founded your own secondhand fashion startup called Outstand. Uh, through the social impact incubator Zinc. So you've advised large corporations, investors, created your own startup, you've taken to the streets to demand change. Your motivation has always been to promote sustainability. So talk to me about why that has been your primary motivator and just how you got started in this space. I always wanted to, for my career and the way I spend my time and resources to have a positive impact. So as far as I can remember when I could pick what to do at uni and think about potential career options, sustainability came to mind as, as a great way for me to give back while having a career that could allow me to take care of myself, um, especially coming from a, a humble background. It was very important for me to have that, that wider impact something a career that would be about more than than just myself and um and i stumble upon fashion along the way when i was looking for the right problem to solve for for my company as you said being in an incubator and realized that fashion had a massive waste issue and at the time um we were reckoning with it but it was very very early stage so i thought something needs to happen there we need to reuse more and and stop extracting more resources when we know that they are so finite and that's how i i ended up in resale so what was it was there any one particular moment or statistic or research where you really realized how big of a problem fashion waste is yes there's one piece of stat that i've hammered around across uh boardrooms to investors all over the place and still to this date at Depop, it's in our induction uh, slides, uh, the fact that every second a truckload of clothes ends up in the landfill. And let's just take one second, a truckload, it's insane, it's so big. And another one is that 70% of what we produce annually in terms of volumes ends up um, in the landfill or incinerated. So there's there's an issue. We, we know that we have three years to do something about climate change and to do something drastic. So such a waste of precious resources seems to me like an obvious issue to spend my time and, and try to yeah, use use my resources to to reduce it as much as possible. That is a shocking statistic. So thank you for always bringing that up in, in the conversations and rooms that you're in. Um, and I think I will continue to do that going forward now too, because more people need to know that. Uh, so you started at Depop in 2019 in your current role. What were you brought on to do? So when I joined Depop, I actually met with Maria Raga, our CEO, um, for insights on, on resale. And um, and at the time, the, the brand had just been through a, a refresh and, and sustainability which and circularity, which has always been a core part of Depop's business model by nature, because, um, because it's, it's a resale platform. Um, she wanted to be become more strategic and structured around sustainability. She could sense how important it was both for the business and, and especially for our community. Um, 
so she brought me in to do the first diagnostic of of the business so it was looking from a, a 360 perspective on on everything from our own operations but also our inventory our people um the full spectrum of what you would call esg environmental social and governance um and on the back of that uh i wrote our first sustainability roadmap which led us um, in January 2021 to release our first sustainability plan. So a two year sustainability plan, which is again, comprehensive 360, which was aimed at getting the basics covered um, because it's not, I'm conscious and we're conscious that our business model is, is virtuous in itself or has um, that, positive ethos to it but there is always more you can do on sustainability and it's not an end goal it's a continuous improvement approach um so that's the the ethos and and the, the approach the the thinking and the mindset that i've seeded in the in the business since i joined so in the years that you've been working on this um and then now at this moment in 2022 what shifts are you seeing at the intersection of fashion sustainability and shopping a lot has changed um obviously a pandemic uh bumped um we bumped across a pandemic uh along the way but i think from a demand side and and at people and and purchasing behavior perspective um sustainability is becoming more and more mainstream so we know that an increasing proportion of the population cares and wants to act in line with their values when they shop they want to vote with their wallets um, and that applies to to fashion so you can see it being manifested in um, the number of searches for sustainable fashion that ramp uh, ramp up on list on Google on Depop, uh, but but also it also manifests in in other in different um, different business models, different circular business models like resell, like rental, like repair. So. People are experimenting with what sustainable fashion means and expanding it. It doesn't necessarily need to be new. Uh, it can be new to me. And one piece of stat that, that I love is that in the US last year, more than 30 million um, people have bought a secondhand item for the first time. And out of those, the majority expect to buy more in the coming years. So we're at a crossroads where sustainability, sustainable fashion, slow fashion, however you, you want to call it, those different ways of, of interacting with fashion are becoming more normal. They're getting normalized, which means that we have great days ahead and I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the future of, uh, of fashion. I love that. I love the optimism, first of all, but also it doesn't have to be new, just new to me. That's such a great concept. I, re I really like that. Um, so how do you think these shifts are going to impact the future of retail and commerce and e-commerce? Executive as ad brands are very smart. Um, that's what that's how they got into their positions. Um, so they're obviously sensitive and aware of those shifts um, when it comes to to consumer behaviors. I don't really like the word consumer, but um, people are 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 buying or not buying differently, um, which means that brands are incredibly increasingly experimenting with those alternative more circular business models so when it comes to <clears throat> when it comes to resell for instance uh, you have a number of brands who are partnering with existing um, more established resale platforms like depop um, but you also have some brands who have have tipped their toes and now decided to create their own platforms um, or some that have been on that path for ages, like Patagonia, for instance, they've been doing this for years. Uh, but 
realistically this is this is something that we see more and more and again you have resell but you also have rental you also have repairs um a number of um retail um department stores are are exper experimenting to embed their services in um in their business as usual and it's um it's incredible to see and and executives are definitely looking in um in that direction so i expect more blended business models and more a mix of new of um, new to you secondhand and complementary services around it to complete that offering uh, for a better, more circular fashion. Now let's talk about Gen Z. They are huge users of your platform. Obviously, they are core to the Teen Vogue audience. They're very interested in vintage, which I think is great. But there are also a lot of misconceptions about them in general, about, about who they are, their habits. So what do you think from your point of view, um, and again, from your research and work, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about Generation Z? I think that trying to put people in boxes, generally speaking, has its limits. And it's even more relevant for Gen Z because we, we've interacted with them. We've we've worked for them um, for more than 10 years now. And um, if there's one thing that we learned is that this generation is incredibly fluid. So they don't really like boxes um, on, on none, no, from, from like no angle. And um, it's interesting to, to bear this in mind because they, they're not afraid to create the path that works for them and to step aside from those that previous generations have walked through, myself included. They, they don't really care. They're willing to just smash the walls and create a new room and, and create their own table rather than demanding a seat at, at a table that exists. Um, <clears throat> and so when it comes to fashion, it means that again they're they're blurring the line and redefining the lines and when it comes to newness for instance they they don't need that brand new thing anymore they define what new to them means and it can mean something that already exists an archive pieces a vintage piece or it can also mean doing something new with what already exists in their wardrobe and upcycle and mix and match um, and that is incredibly creative so it's a source of of inspiration uh for them between them and also for other generations because one thing that we know is that a piece of research that we've we've done with um bain last year showed that 70 percent of gen z feel that they influence their family and friends purchases which means that when they start doing something actually other age groups pay attention so we can harness that for good as well so you talked about redefining uh, the lines a little bit and of course blurred lines as well so when we're talking about gen z redefining fashion and style um what is important to them gen z obviously cares um a lot about the, the state of the planet and social inequalities and that is manifests or at least they say, in how um, how they shop and how they buy and engage with engage with fashion. A very interesting um, piece of stat that we've unveiled is that on on Depop, forty five percent of our users only buy secondhand. So they take agency and they take action in thinking. Um, they see the the pitfalls of the, the world in which we operate and decide to do differently. And from their perspective, buying secondhand or buying less and buying secondhand are arsenals, are tools in their arsenal to, um, to reduce their, their impact. And that is something that previous generations attached a lot of stigma to secondhand and with um, platforms like Depop and brand like Depops, uh, we have we have made it cool. They have made it cool to buy secondhand 
which leads now to other generations looking at secondhand way more seriously than before. And as we said uh, earlier, um, more established brands who would have never looked at it five or 10 years ago, I would say even five years ago, are now jumping um, on the bandwagon, which is great news. You kind of anticipated my next question, but I'd love to dig in a little bit more into these habits that you mentioned, which is um, how Gen Z does use platforms like Depop. So you mentioned that 45% stat, which is super interesting. So are they using these platforms to buy the bulk of their wardrobe or is it often used for one-off unique pieces? It sounds like there's a mix of that. Yeah, I think so. It's like, again, as I said, it, it's <clears throat> there are as many Gen Z users as there are users and individuals on, on Depop. So everyone has a different approach to, to their wardrobe. But, but across the board, um, what we see is that there's a, a drive for reducing and consuming differently. And, and they make those purchases on Depop, they make those secondhand purchases intentionally. And um, they definitely see this as a step in their sustainability journey to lead more sustainable um, lifestyles. And that's the type of things that we want to nurture as a company, because what I always like to, to say is um, from a behavioral perspective, it is easy to ask someone to do a small change, like a, a small switch. Uh, and we make it easy with Depop because it looks and feels like something you know, uh, except it's secondhand. So then we validate you and make you feel good about this. And you realize that you can do it. And then hopefully you will start to think of other switches easy switches in your life. And next time you want to buy a smartphone, you may look at buying it secondhand or furniture and so on. And that's how we get more people on, on the sustainable lifestyle journey. You've talked a little bit about generational differences already and how Gen Z can influence other generations. Um, my take is from, from just knowing our audience and listening to our audience, Gen Z is, is more urgent about the climate crisis and sustainability because they were born into this urgency, right? They, they didn't have a choice. It was the previous generations that came before them and all of the poor decisions made up until this point and how they impacted the planet, but it's Gen Z and younger that has to deal with it now, the, the after effects. But I'm curious from your perspective, um, how you think Gen Z perceives sustainability, why it is so urgent for them. Um, and again, what, uh, what older generations might be able to learn from them. I think you, you put it, um, exactly the, the way the way I approach it. It's for them, and actually for all of us now, sustainability is no longer a nice to have. It's the reality. As I said earlier, we have the um, the IPCC report tells us we have three years to do something. It's urgent. The planet is actually burning. So it's it's not a nice to have. It's uh, mandatory. We all need to take action. And Gen Z le lives with this every day. So it comes with a lot of eco-anxiety that, that is a thing that drives them. But then this combined with their incredible entrepreneurial spirit and can-do attitude, um, as I said earlier, they, they don't take things for granted and they don't take the path that has been there or has been mapped out for them as the only way forward. They're willing to try new things. Um, they're willing to create new businesses. They're willing to trial new career path. For instance, on, on Depop, they may have started um, to sell things uh, that they didn't wear in their wardrobe and now they scaled and have graduated to become successful entrepreneur, making um, more than a million um, in turnover. But the point here is that they do take action uh, and, and they do, do not take no for, for an answer. So I think rather than how they perceive sustainability, I would flip the question around and say how sustainability has been impacted by Gen Z. And as they age and, and reach that adult um, age right now, they have more agency, more power, they're making their voice heard. And we feel this 
um, the sustainability agenda gets more airtime and we desperately we desperately need it. So um, I'm incredibly grateful and admirative of this generation because they give us the push that we need. I completely agree. Um, now there is a little bit of a paradox um, among some of the cohort though, because of course, Gen Z is the most vocal um, about climate concerns. They're also some of the biggest consumers of fast fashion which we're talking a lot about. They've grown up in this social media saturated world that encourages a steady stream of new outfits. Um, I think there was, there was a great piece in the business of fashion recently that's like for a lot of these fast fashion platforms, clothing is content. Now it's not, it's not just clothing, it becomes this whole um, content on your social media. So these values do seem at odd with one another. Um, and I'm curious if you see one of them becoming stronger, especially as we kind of emerge into the next phase of the pandemic. They are at odds. And um, and I analyze this, we all analyze it and are witness of some ultra fast fashion giants rising um, while those concerns on the other end are very pressing and, and we're all aware about them. And, and as I said earlier, and as you, as you outlined, um, we know that Gen Z cares deeply about the planet, about people. Um, so how do we reckon with, with both? Exactly. It's, a, it's a challenge. I think rather than going and being confrontational about this um, and saying no or calling out, which I don't think has been a very effective solution in anything. If you think of, of people smoking, they know that it's not good for your health, but they keep, they keep, they keep on smoking. So a bit similarly, I think the reality is if we want to close that, um, what behavioral scientists call value action gap. So what you want to do versus what you actually do. So you want to walk the talk and buy sustainable, lead a sustainable lifestyle. But when it comes to actually doing it, you slip. And as you outlined, we live in a world where we need to analyze the context in which that generation has been growing up and keeps on, on, on growing up, which is a world of immediacy where we've been trained to um, absorb trends and want newness and want it now with a next day delivery. So <clears throat> realistically, if we want this generation to get closer and close that value action gap, we need to offer them um, seamless and efficient and aspirational solutions that offer the same, um, the same service and meet their demands. And I think platforms like Depop, where we offer you the cool uh, fashion, the unique fashion at a competitive price, to um, to what you would find in a first hand market, this is how we close that gap. So I think there's an offer, um, there's there's an offer thread to to tackle this, and then there is also a narrative piece, which is that I used to personally buy fast fashion years ago. I've stopped now, obviously, um, but I needed my haha moment. And I needed to get to know that stat on waste and truckload of waste ending up in the landfill every year. And we, we need to get those, those stats and those narratives and those documentaries like the true cost in front of a number of people to get them to connect and realize that this thing that you treat like content, as you said, or you treat as disposable and you may wear once because you have an event and you, you don't really think about the consequences of it until someone tells you, do you know someone made that garment? Do you know that this is made out of renewable, non-renewable um, non -renewable resources that we're desperately in need to preserve? And I think the combination of those two is what will get that generation in line with what they aspire to do because we know they want to 
Um, but the world in which they operate sends them a lot of conflicting messages. So we need to analyze this and give them a hand. Um, a hand. Yeah, no, you made, you made so many great points there. And I, I completely agree. I think information is such a huge part of it. And I think um, we're learning more every day, right? And you also mentioned a competitive price point, which I think is important because I think with these fast fashion giants, a lot of it, when I'm talking to like my younger staff or, or younger people that I know, they mention, well, um, fast fashion is affordable when a lot of other retailers or brands are not. And then also there is a whole conversation about size inclusivity that some of the fast fashion retailers offer a broader size range than other brands do. Um, so that's another reason they may go to them. So it's just a great point about all the conflicting messages that they're receiving and, and hopefully we can continue to help sort that out. Um, now Depop you say is a platform that is shaped by the belief that listening to your community is the key to future proofing your business. So what are you learning from your community? everything uh, literally um, we wouldn't be there without them we we have a saying internally that says that we win um, when they win so we nurture entrepreneurs whether it's a side hustle and you just want to make uh, a buck on the side with your wardrobe or you want to create um, a um, million dollar business like like um, internet girl Bella on, on Depop. We are here to cater for for all of this. And um, as I as I said earlier, the, the community, the drive, the the inspiration that that they breathe um, into Depop is what makes it uh, what makes it exciting. So I would say that yeah, we, we wouldn't be there without them and listening to them constantly and making sure that as we grow, we keep a pulse on, on what they tell us, what they see, what they like, the type of trends that, that emerge on Depop. And then we see a couple of weeks, months, or sometimes years uh, on Depop before they reach um, the catwalk or the high street, like this comes from from them. So we we wouldn't be where we were where we are today without them. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship, which you've mentioned. Um, social media is obviously essential to driving a lot of Gen Z businesses, but brand owners aren't necessarily using it to drive sales specifically. What do you think is the biggest misconception about how Gen Z founders are using social media um, as marketing business development tools? Gen Z are social media natives. So First and foremost, what turns into a marketing business development tool eventually as they grow initially is not meant to be that. They, it's just how they live their lives and they share their identity. It's not even a personal brand, it's them. And so as, as a founder, and especially when you're in, um, at the beginning of, of your company, the founder is the brand. So there is there is little distinction, and the the, um, the borders are blurred between uh, the founder and and their company, and that seeds and breathes authenticity into their brand. Because what is amazing when um, when you follow those Gen Z founders as they scale and and grow, is that you can go through the ups and downs with them. Um, and usually they also cross pollinate. So they use their Instagram um, alongside, for instance, on Depop, um, I mentioned Bella, uh, internet girl. She has a huge following on Instagram. And so when she would drop on Depop, she would um, give a heads up on, on her Instagram and, and vice versa. So I think that first and foremost, like the, mo the more important piece is authenticity. It doesn't come from a calculated piece at the beginning. They're just sharing their story as they would with anything else that happens in, in their lives. And, um, and as a follower, you're just bought into them as a person. So you're even more bought into their business. Um, and as we said, 
the fact that Gen Z is so in tune with um, sustainability makes it that they tend to align what they do in, um, in their personal lives with what they do in their business. And you can see this in a very transparent way uh, throughout their journey, which tends to lead you to buy more into their service or their products. Um, how are platforms like Depop, Instagram, and TikTok impacting the economy outside of, you know, the, the traditional legacy, direct-to-consumer, brick-and-mortar brands? The first thing is that we do create entrepreneurs. So what may have started as a little side hustle or a funny thing to do, um, something entertaining, because there's that common thread between Depop and, and, and TikTok where are you a creator or are you um, an entrepreneur? Do you have a business or are you creating content? And all of those are, are kind of, of, um, of blurred, are, are blurred. So this leads to true full-fledged, very tangible businesses entering the economy. Um, and as I said, we have examples uh, like uh, Lucy and Yak, for instance, who started to sell on Depop dungarees from, from dead stock and, and faulty um, items. And now I saw no later than, than last week, someone rock one of their dungarees in the streets of New York City. Wow. And they, they started in a small shop, in, in a small Depop shop, and now they're on billboards in the tube in London. So this is very tangible. Those are businesses that employ people now. Um, so we, we absolutely love seeing that. And um, another thing that I mentioned before is trends that come in and out of, of Depop. And, um, and it's incredible to see things that we have uh, seen on our Explore page years ago, like, the Y2K trend, for instance, that Bella had Bella had to absolutely love and is an amazing ambassador for. She shops on, on Depop and now Y2K is everywhere, um, all over the, the, the editorials of magazines on Teen Vogue included. And we were talking about Y2K like years ago. Yeah. So it's amazing to see those things coming from us to the to the to the outside world. And, and it keeps growing. And it's in terms of styles, but also in terms of um, behaviors like tie and dye, for instance, or upcycling. Those are things that our sellers are super creative, super crafty, um, and now seeing again bigger brands, big houses, um, jumping on the, on the DIY, the upcycling, while our sellers have been championing this for years is incredible to see. Yeah, I love that. Um, another one that comes to mind is Olivia Rodrigo, obviously Gen Z superstar, and, and she's worked with Depop before, and I know she's a huge fan of um, Y2K clothing and vintage clothing in general. So our audience is definitely following all of those trends closely as well. I think that's great. Um, now shifting focus a little bit to legacy brands who have built their success um, on curated images. How do you think that they can reach Gen Z in a way that feels relevant um, without sacrificing maybe their core brand identity? I would say partnering and true Depop ethos is all about collaborating, right? If, you, if you've not historically engaged with this generation, it would probably feel a bit odd and inauthentic to just go right at them. But partnering with others who have been um, engaging with that audience before you seems like a, um, a safer and more efficient path. So for us, for instance, it means um, we have been working in the past uh, with a number of legacy brands like Ralph Lauren or like Levi's. And we love doing this because what we, we bring the legacy brand and they're super uh, aspirational archive with um, the drive, the creativity, the energy of our sellers who sometimes have been, they've been hardcore fans of those brands 
and we get them to meet and work together and create collections and upcycle pieces together. And the feedback that we get from both brands and sellers is incredible because on one hand, we have legacy brands who get tons of insights and energy from, from those sellers who've been worshiping those brands for years and curating inventory uh for from those brands and then on the other side we have the sellers who've been looking up to those brands their entire lives who can have discussions with their brand marketing team executives and those are the some of the most exciting um interactions that that we can facilitate at depop collaboration and partnerships i think that that's so smart um in the future of any industry including journalism as well um that said as generation z ages do you think there is an expectation that they will fall into more traditional purchasing habits like generations before them? Um, obviously, they won't be trend setting teens and early 20s of, of forever. Um, so do you think brands should should really be shifting their long term strategies to meet them or what makes them different? What makes these changes potentially permanent in your view? I can't predict the future, so I don't know who's going to behave how and yeah. especially I would say, especially in a post-pandemic world where our behaviors have whole, everyone's behavior has changed uh, dramatically since, since the pandemic. So I don't think making projections on how a generation that is so fluid and, and so diverse would make any sense. I would rather focus on mindsets and, and I think mindsets cut across um, age group. And what we love about Gen Z, but can be found in, in other, other age groups is that progressive mindset, that can-do attitude, that entrepreneurial spirit of, yes, we are in crisis, but we're, we're just going to hold hands and do something about it. I don't think this is, um, something that necessarily is only um, can only be found with Gen Z. It can be found other ways, and it's something that we want to nurture as as a company. Because realistically, if we want to tackle the crisis we're in, we need those types of people, and we need them to feel empowered to to drive change. So I would I would say that for us as a brand, but for other brands. Um, obsessing about one generation um, is, is not going to be the silver bullet, especially given the emergency we're, we're facing. And I think that we can serve those positive mindsets, those positive behaviors, um, and that will be a win-win for everyone. It will be a win for, um, for businesses because we know that people across age groups want to align what they what they think with how they shop so realistically this this group of people is going to to grow over time um so it makes business sense but it also makes planet sense because we we all need to uh we we need all hands on deck basically to tackle that crisis i think that is a great point to end on but as we do bring this to a close for anybody who wants to learn more, do more, have more impact in their individual lives and habits, what would you recommend they take away from today's discussion or, or um, what do you want them to keep in mind as they go forward? My first recommendation to anyone is not to under, underestimate the power of your actions and, um, and what you can do and how you can influence others. So it means you vote with your, you vote with your wallet um, and you can vote by not using to, by, by choosing not to use your wallet. That's a very, very strong signal. Uh, but then you also, by doing those things and walking the talk, you are, you are influencing others. Others are paying attention and your close circles do pay attention. So, so I think if, if everyone tried, and I'm not advocating for everyone to be perfect because it's impossible, um, but we have agency, we can ask for change. It starts with, again, yeah, how you use your wallet, how you, you decide to buy things, um, but also how you use your voice. 
in those conversations with your friends, with your family, with your employer, uh, your manager. And if we were all having those um, more consistently, I think things would shift faster. And we did it. Yeah, that's great advice. Justine, this has been so insightful, so thoughtful. I really appreciate your time and your work. So thank you so much for joining us today and having this conversation. Thank you so much for having me.